It is a huge pleasure to be here today. I'm very glad kind of, we have a chance to talk about a topic that I think kind of, is immensely interesting, which is looking at data standards and which is looking at how data basically makes it possible for all of us to make progress within biomedical research. First of all, I would like to start just by reiterating probably kind of the obvious, which is why everybody is here. All of us are here because we want to develop new and better therapies. We want to make research in the biomedical sciences and in other fields more robust. We want to make sure that we generate data that are reliable, insights that are meaningful, and above all, progress that in the end kind of benefits societies. At the same time, when we look into the biopharmaceutical industry and into the biotechnology industry and the life sciences research, we can see that productivity has been declining. There is something that has been called Irum's law, which is the reverse of Moore's law, that shows how the number of drugs being approved per research dollar or per research billion dollar spent has been going down consecutively for the past about 50 years. This is something which is quite scary because all of us know that drug discovery is already kind of a very expensive and very error prone and very time consuming process. So if we add basically um, this loss of productivity on top of it, it is conceivable we're going to arrive at a point relatively, relatively soon actually, where productivity drops to a level that is no longer sustainable to develop new drugs. If we try to look kind of into the, the underlying reasons and some of the, the issues that we can see within the life sciences research context, then we can realize that one of the key issues is data quality. We know that only around 10 to 20 percent of all peer-reviewed published research findings are actually reproducible, only 10 to 20 percent. These were studies done kind of and published in Nature and in, in Nature Reviews, where we've seen that companies such as Bayer and Amgen trying to reproduce published research findings only succeeded in this very small number of cases. At the same time, speed is the other big issue. And speed is has to do kind of what, what type of work we do and how we do our work. And in this case, we all know kind of how many new publications basically come out every day, how much time we'd actually need to discuss our results, think about the results we get, and take the time to, for example, apply for the next grant. At the same time, what reality looks like is that only around three to five percent of a researcher's time is spent with, for example, reading, thinking, hypothesizing, whereas the majority of one's time is taken up with manual lab work. This can also be seen on the photos on the right hand side, where we can see the laboratories in the biomedical sciences as well as in other areas in many ways have not changed in the past few decades. Of course, we now have new devices, so for example, a PCR machine, a new microscope, but the work mode itself and the way we approach data generation, which is key to research, has really not evolved much in a long time. And this is why kind of in a slightly provocative way, we could say that lab research, biomedical research, in many ways has not kept pace with the innovation that we're seeing in many other areas. In all other industries, electronics, computers, the cloud, robotics, 3D printing, have transformed the way we go about our lives, the way we generate, for example, new products, new services, and the way we think about data. But at the same time, kind of very few of these things have actually been seen to have an impact on the way that we do research in the life sciences. What is absolutely critical is to understand that what we're looking at right now in terms of data generation, in terms of data use, is only the tip of the iceberg. Data sets in research in general, but kind of in this case, based in drug discovery and biomedical research, for the most part consist of small, isolated, unlinked data sets. Often a publication will be built around, for example, four, five, six different figures. However, the underlying data, the raw data, in many cases is not made accessible. Even if it is, storage systems are fragmented, data form is not standardized. One researcher might have a publication with some data over here, the second publication with a different data set, having used different standards is over there. 
even repositories don't really offer an opportunity to bring together these different data sets because they were being generated following ambiguous and non-standardized methods and protocols. For example, a protocol might say mix a sample, but mixing a sample could happen in so many different ways, stirring, shaking, vortexing for half a minute, for five minutes. All of these differences have a tremendous impact on how reliable data is in the end. So what we have to do is we have to move away from only have seeing out of the tip of the iceberg, from only looking at, for example, a microscope image, and we have to look at everything which comes, comes underneath. We have to look kind of at the, at the real amount of data that is hidden within experiment. And this means looking at metadata, looking at how the experiment was being conducted, looking at how were the protocols being, how can the protocols be standardized? How can we make sure we're having transparent and comprehensive audit trails? Ideally, we bring data together in an interoperable database. And at the same time, in terms of quality of reagents, another topic that is of particular concern in life sciences is reagent provenance. We want to make sure we're only using reagents where we know what we've actually been, what we've actually been using. In this case, kind of the example is always cell lines. A lot of researchers will be familiar with using cell lines for their research. And in many cases nowadays, journals will ask for cell lines to be verified before a publication can be submitted for publication. However, before kind of before that became mandatory over the past few years, people showed that about one in two cell lines, about every second cell line used in research was either contaminated or misidentified. In other words, as a researcher, you might have assumed you were working with a human kidney cell line. Instead, it was a mouse liver. And these things have happened so many times that by now, a lot of the research that has been published is, um, has, been, has been cast in doubt and is considered questionable. With that in mind, we have to do things differently. We have to think about data generation in a completely, completely novel way. What is absolutely critical in this context is the concept of metadata. Metadata is very closely linked with the idea of structuring information so that it becomes accessible, not just for humans, but also for machines. The example we can look at is, again, based an experimental protocol. On the left-hand side, that is based in an uh, excerpt from my own lab notebook from my PhD. What we can see in the middle is a spreadsheet that's at least somehow machine readable. It will still have custom fields, it will still have a lack of standardization in, in terminology, but at least it's already typed and no longer handwritten. But where we actually want to move is we want to represent factual information, in this case, as an RDF statement, which is an example for a form of data representation that allows a machine to draw different conclusions because all the data is interconnected and data contains rich metadata information that goes beyond the actual data set and points towards how it's being generated and how it can be used in the future. Metadata is something which is at the core of something that over the past four, four or five years has really seen a tremendous, tremendous growth and tremendous attention within the life sciences and within the general data community, which is the concept of FAIR. We want data to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So what does that mean? So if we look kind of at the diagram, we can see there is certain layers, and all of those are extremely important. The innermost layer is basically a digital object. In this case, there could be, for example, in a, in a digital sense, it would be basically binary sequence, ones and zeros. However, we need to make sure kind of that this data in itself is present in a standard format. So it could be, for example, an XML file, as opposed to a very custom file format, then it's going to be very difficult to open in the future. At the same time, we're also basically looking at things like persistent identifiers, metadata, and ideally kind of a fully documented data set where there's basically additional ancillary information available as well. <clears throat> 
this second layer is the persistent and unique identifiers. This is something which is which allows an object to be to be tracked. Identifiers can also be used in many different contexts. So many of us will have an, an orchid ID. Um, there's also um, raids and other basically other cases where these persistent and unique identifiers enable us to make a very clear association between an object and, and its, um, its, its, its affiliation. And this is something that's absolutely critical and something which, for example, when submitting a, a publication, submitting a manuscript for publication, many people will be familiar with the Gold Ring Association that basically has a database where you can basically select your organization where you're coming from. It is always going to be clear that, for example, University of Oxford is the same as Oxford University, U of O, Oxford Uni, etc. So instead of having kind of this rather chaotic terminology, these PIDs can help us to really have one identifier that's generally understood and generally valid. I've already mentioned the, the question of standards. So standards is something which makes sure the data can be used as widely as possible and that software is available to read those files. We already know that one of the biggest, biggest headaches that data scientists are going to have in 10 years or in 15 years time is going to be to try to open files, written in file formats, that by that time will no longer be supported. In other words, making it as easy as possible to access data to store the data and to reuse the data is extremely important. Finally, metadata. And so metadata is something which then basically allows us to have the, the contextual information that puts data into, into kind of a wider, into a wider basically framework. So for example, was the object created at a certain time of day? Was a certain experimental data point created at, for example, a specific, at a specific temperature or humidity or gas concentration. These are all factors that right now are often not being captured, but at the same time, they're immensely important for reproducibility and they're immensely important to make sure that data that is being generated can actually be used for meaningful, meaningful scientific progress. If we look into the fair data kind of slightly more closely, so the findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, we can see that basically under findable kind of the um, Wilkinson's publication basically put out a few key characteristics that we need to think about and that should be addressed ideally in every single research project. In every single case where data is being generated, we need to think about fair data. We've already mentioned the unique and persistent identifier Bias. We've already mentioned the rich metadata. At the same time, there must also be kind of a link between kind of the metadata and kind of the identifier. And ideally, kind of data has to be in a searchable context. And this is something where basically data queries also become very important because we really do want to make sure that whatever we do can actually be found by someone else. And this is being, being elaborated on in the busy category of accessible, where you can see that there must be standardized protocols for retrieval. At the same time, protocols should be open. They should contain an authentication authorization procedure. And metadata should always be accessible. So even if, for example, um, intellectual property considerations or privacy considerations might make it more difficult to access the original data, the results data, we should still know what was being generated, when, and ideally why. Interoperability refers to the ability to have data that can be used in a, in a very, in, in a shareable way, so that we can can make sure that something which was generated in one context can also be applied and also be used and made use of in a second very different context. This is something where it's extremely important to look at the vocabulary, terminologies, ontologies, but we can make sure that something was being described in one way can then actually be used in another because we understand what was being meant. Finally, reusability. 
it is extremely important that we know that the, the attributes and basically of the various descriptors are actually accurate and that they're basically as, as rich and as encompassing as possible. At the same time, we want to make sure that we know where data came from so that we can also always ascertain that the original source was legitimate, that we could also ascribe, for example, authorship, which is something which obviously in the scientific community is extremely important, and that we can also make sure that data always meets the standards of a specific community. And the last point in particular is extremely important because in some communities we already have quite well-developed well -developed environments for certain data standards, whereas in others, this is still very much work in progress. This is basically a case study that I've chosen basically from our own basic background and experience where we're saying in the life sciences context for a biological experiment, ideally what we'd like to do is that we'd like to move from the idea stage to a completed experiment in one, in one process that is thought through, that follows fair principles, that makes sure that all the data and metadata is being captured from idea till completion of data generation. Because one very important general lesson is that fair data practices are much easier to implement from the start, as opposed to trying to verify information that has already been generated. This whole verification process is something which has gathered a lot of attention over the past few years, but it really is not easy. So in other words, ideally, we start with the process from the beginning, from the idea stage. In this case, what we basically designed is a process where we start with the idea for an experiment. It then basically moves into a description stage that is that follows fair principles, moves into execution, followed by the generation of certain data files that then are being processed to lead to a final data file or asset. The next step is then going to focus on the AEFF, which is kind of the Arcturus experiment file format, which in our case had to fulfill primarily kind of two, two requirements. One, to be highly performant in a way that we can actually use it in a timely fashion and in a fashion that doesn't require too much disk space, which again also makes it easier for others to use the format as well. And at the same time, following the principle of interoperability, making sure that there are always full specifications, there are free readers and free writers, and validators in any language of choice, be it kind of C, be it, um, be it Python, whatever you want to look at, you will find a pair of readers and writers to access that file format. So basically, one more slide in the AEFF. In this case, we can say that the experiment file that is being used contains all of the descriptions of the sources of data, contains all of the metadata, both structural which means, for example, how the asset was being, was being, is being related to others in the first place, as well as the acquisition metadata. So for example, was the process conducted at 25 degrees or 26 degrees, that would be acquisition metadata. And finally, statistical information, for example, variation between different data sets, for example, um, statistical measures of, of, um, of deltas between different data points, all of this would be in there. So why is this important and why have we chosen enough to go down that path? For us, it is primarily about reproducibility and reusability. On the reproducibility side, we can say that every single experiment that is run is always going to be run the same way every single time. Normally, when you run an experiment in a laboratory, just having designed the experiment and having written down the protocol does not mean you're going to get the same results every single time. In many cases, an experiment, experiment protocol might contain information such as do an overnight incubation. And as we all know, an overnight incubation could be anything between six hours and 15 hours. So in other words, even if the protocol is there, it does not guarantee that execution is the same from time to time. And this is one of the factors where it's extremely important to capture all of that information and to make sure the protocol actually specifies all of these, all of these very exact timings and other conditions. 
The other factors are, of course, kind of more relevant for the automated setting, where, for example, you want different experiments happening at the same time not to influence each other. We also want to make sure that experiments are being optimized before they're being sent to the robotic system. And finally, we're basically also doing regular experiments on the side of the, um, of the, of the data generating experiments that only serve to collect platform states and to record so-called envelope variations that show us what the overall, overall differences are in, for example, caused by minor deviations in temperature. In terms of reusability, what the basic means for us is that experiments can both be reused and experimental procedures can both be reused within our platform as well as in the outside world, where with the read and write-up, as I've been mentioning before, scientists can access a protocol and they know exactly what has happened, how it has happened, which temperature, which timing, which other conditions. At the same time, it's also of interest to reuse certain experiments, which means a data set is being accumulated, can then be, for example, reused for data and metadata mining. And finally, whenever the pipeline contains intermediate results, those can then be reused for different types of analysis. For example, someone might want to conduct one statistical analysis versus the other, and this is all possible. To show an example, just kind of to, to give a bit of a visual impression what the embassy looks like in real life, we can see that moving, in this case, from for a biochemical assay, from a very traditional zero dilution approach, where we have a data curve that consists of a few data points and inter interpolation, we can then move to a machine generated graph that contains a far larger number of data points. And these data points have been generated, um, in this case, kind of using a liquid handling workstation, which means that instead of only doing 10 or 11 data points and performing curve interpolation, we can instead generate a very dense graph that consists of a multitude of different measurements. At the same time, the same graph also contains all the metadata we mentioning before. We know what the equipment was like, we know the work conditions were like, we know the timings, we know the quality measures. So in other words, we're getting a very different data sets compared to what would have been happening in a normal manual laboratory. The reason why this is important is because the concept of capturing data and metadata has huge implications, again, for reproducibility and thereby for the applicability of research results. And this is something that has been recognized. So there is a few entities, there are a few entities that have already seen the need to work on data standards and to work on data best practices within the life sciences ecosystem. Probably the most important player is the Pistoia Alliance. The Pistoia Alliance is a very clear mission, which is lowering barriers to innovation. They were started in 2007 with a handful of pharma companies that realized that they really basically want to do things together because everyone on their own is not going to be able to bring about the large scale change, both in terms of policies as well as in terms of in terms of basic general approaches that will be necessary for all of us to move towards a world where fair data practices, metadata capture and, and, and adequate data stewardship are just considered standard. At the same time, the Stoya Alliance has grown considerably over the past over the past years. We were also a member organization, and so obviously many others, companies, universities, research centers, and all of them basically are united by the idea and by the notion that we need to work on our data standards because the way we've been generating data so far is just not sustainable. Yeah. <clears throat> As the final slide, kind of this is basically kind of again basically from the Pistoia Alliance. I would just like to point out that what we've just seen is basically only scratching the surface in terms of data, data standards, data stewardship. It is a space that is evolving rapidly. In case of the Pistoia Alliance, there's various different platforms and various different projects that have been built over the past few years that focus, for example, on fair data implementation, that focus on AI machine learning, drug discovery that focus on ontologies um, on the level of the future, on unified data models. So in other words, 
everybody who does have an interest in data, data stewardship, best data practices within the drug discovery and within the biomedical, um, the biomedical space should definitely now think about reaching out to the Stoya Alliance and learning a bit more about the work they're doing um, because it is probably one of the foremost organization for data standards within our space. With that, I would like to come to the end of the talk and just basically reiterate that what we've seen over the past few years is the realization that we need to move from only looking at isolated, small, unlinked data sets into something far more comprehensible, into something that basically has a lot of focus on data quality, data accessibility, on shareability, and also on what we can actually do with the data, which is generate new insights. With that, I would like to come to the end. Thank you very much for your attention. And please do feel free to ask any questions. Thank you very much.